Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 5. So we had a quick two-part sermon series. This is the second part of our Galatians 5 sermon series. Of course, last week we talked about, we see this idea in Galatians chapter 5 of these works of the flesh and then the fruits of the Spirit. And last week, of course, we talked about um, this list, which is called the uh, works of the flesh that Galatians chapter 5 lists for us. And this morning, we're going to look at the other side of this coin. We're going to look at the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. Look down at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. And this is also um, on the front of your bulletin. But the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit. So we see this, this terrible list that we talked about last week, which is the works of the flesh. But then the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So verse number 25 is interesting, where it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So we see this idea that it says, if we live in the Spirit. So what does that mean? It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Well, Romans 6 kind of uh, mirrors this same idea. If you look at Romans 6 and verse number 4, the Bible says this. It says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So if you're saved today, you know, you live in the Spirit. You know, if you're saved, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, has indwelled you, has sealed you. You know, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about how the Holy Spirit is the mechanism that seals your salvation. That's how we know that we're saved forever, one of the many places in the Bible where it says that. But look, it says that if we live in the Spirit, which if you're saved, you live in the Spirit. The Spirit is living with you right now. It says, let us also walk in the Spirit. Does that say that you will walk in the Spirit? Does that say that if you are saved and the Holy Spirit is in you, that you will automatically just walk in the Spirit? No, it, it, I mean, it doesn't, right? I mean, look, this is, the, this is the other side. I mean, we don't believe that we're saved by works, thus you know, we're saved eternally, thus your works don't keep you saved, the works don't have anything to do with sealing you or anything like that. But look, we should walk in the Spirit. Just like Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, it says, you know, even so we also for sure will walk in newness of life. No, that's not what it says. It says, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So if you're saved today, that doesn't mean that you know, you're suddenly, you know, you've achieved sinless perfection. That's right. Okay? I mean, you'll find people out there that believe this. That, oh, you know, I'm saved and now I'm perfect. Well, you're not saved. Sorry. Right. Because, you know, you know, if you're saved, you're without sin, you deceive yourself. Right. And the truth is not in you. Right. Okay? So look, we should walk in these things, though. So let's go through this list. Let's go through this list of, of these fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 is a measuring stick for us. Galatians chapter 5 is, is showing us, hey, where are you at in your life, in your Christian life, in this walk, right? Where are you at with this walk? You should walk in newness of life. How are you doing? Let's check on it this morning, okay? We saw the things that we shouldn't be in last week. Let's look and study the things that we should be in. Let's go through the list. Um, and then we'll, we'll apply it to our lives and find out how that should affect, you know, how we look at things going forward. All right, verse number 22. The Bible says, I mean, this is the good list, okay? The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. So the first thing that we see listed here is love, right? I mean, everyone, everyone should agree with that, right? I mean, the first thing that we see listed is love. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 4, I'm sorry. 1 John chapter 4. So the first thing listed is love. 1 John chapter 4, look at verse number 8. Where the Bible says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. I mean, the Bible says here that God is literally love. Okay? Now look, people, God's a lot of things. Love is one of them. Okay? Now, God's, a lot of, God's also holy. 
All right, we're not going to get into that. But people take this God is love football today and they run way too far with it. God is love, but the question is, since love is the first fruit of the Spirit that we are supposed to follow, you know, what, who are we supposed to love is the question. Okay? And the answer is, let's just look at who God loves and who God doesn't love. And you're like, what, God doesn't love everybody? Turn to Hosea chapter 9. I mean, God loves everybody. That's what, that's what everybody teaches today, is that God just loves everybody no matter what. First of all, that makes no sense, and I'm going to explain it to you. But God is love. That's true. It's right there in 1 John. God is love. So in order for us to mirror who and what we should love, let's just, let's just love what God loves. So let's look at what the Bible says. Look at Hosea chapter 9. Right after Daniel is the book of Hosea. Right after Daniel is the book of Hosea. Look at Hosea chapter 9 and verse number 15 in your Bible. And the Bible says this. It says, All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house, and I will love them no more. I mean, is that hard to understand? So this is God speaking here. He says, I will drive them out of my house, and I will love them no more. So, first of all, at one point, God did love these people. Okay? So there was a point where God loved these people. But then there was a point where he said, I will love them no more. Well, why? Well, the Bible explains it to us. Okay? All their princes are what? Are revolters, the Bible says. All right? Now, look, John 3.16 is true. For God so loved the world. Right? So people will say, oh, well, God loves the world. God, no, God loved the world. God did love these people. And it, it, Hosea chapter 9 and verse number 15 does not contradict John 3.16. God loved the world. He loved these people, but they revolted against him. Okay, now that is a key here because, look, at one time God loved every single individual. Turn to Romans um, chapter 1 and verse number 30. Well, I'll just read it for you. But this is, why, this is why, you know, some people revolted against God, some people have revolted against God, and some people will revolt against God. That's why the Bible says in Romans 1.30, it says that these people are haters of God. Right. Look, they're not indifferent. They're literally against the Lord. Right. There's people like that out there. So look, God doesn't just give up on anybody. He, you know, it's those that... that turn against him. Right. All right? It's those that literally fight him. Look, there was two sorcerers in the book of Acts. Right? There was two sorcerers in the book of Acts. One sorcerer, I mean, that's a wicked thing. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, you should not suffer a witch to live. There was a man practicing sorcery in the book of Acts, and he ended up getting saved. But then there was another sorcerer who in the story, what was he doing? He was fighting Paul. Paul was trying to get somebody saved. Paul was trying to preach the gospel to somebody, and this sorcerer was trying to stop the truth. He was fighting God. He was fighting the gospel. So that man was, this, the Bible says he was a son of Belial. You know, he was a, a child of the devil. Because he was actively fighting the Lord. Look, this is not most people. This is not, I mean, thank God it's not most people. But look, most unsaved people are just unsaved. They're just not saved. You know, it's one thing to not be saved, to just be indifferent, to just not care about the Lord. It's another thing to actively hate God. And those people are out there to fight against Him. And soul winner, you know this is true because you're going to meet these people. You're going to meet these people who, you know, look, the vast majority of people out there, they're just not saved, and they're just not going to get saved. Because they just don't care. They just, they're just not interested. Look, that's not a hater of God. You know, but then you'll meet these people that they hate the Lord. They're mad that you're there. They hate that you're going to talk to anybody else about the Bible. And they are actively fighting against God. Those people are there. And thank God they're not the majority. So, you'll see Romans 1 proven again and again and again to you in your life, especially if you're a soul winner. So, who are we to love? Turn to John 14. So we see that God, you know, God doesn't love these people that hate Him. 
People can get to a point where God loves them no more. Okay, and you say, well, I've never heard this before. That's because, you know, fake Christianity out there has invented a God that doesn't exist. You need to just tell yourself that if it's in the Bible, I'm going to believe it, period. You know, if you want somebody to lie to you, you're in the wrong building. Look at John 14. The Bible says this. Who are we to love? It says, if you love me, God is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Does that say if you want to go to heaven, keep my commandments? No, it says if you love me. So can you be saved and not love God? Absolutely. You can be saved, you can receive that gift, and then just go off into chastisement for the rest of your life and just not love God. Because look, this gives us the proper definition of love right here. The definite love has been ruined by modern society. The word love. Because love is action. It's doing something. Love is not this butterfly feeling, you know, I mean, Hollywood will just completely mess this up. Hollywood basically turns lust into love, is what they do. But, you know, if you get married and you're like, oh, I love uh, my wife because I have these butterflies in my stomach every time she comes around, and you think that's love, you're, you're going you're gonna to be sadly mistaken. Because love is action. Love is sacrifice towards whatever you're saying that you love. Okay? Thank God that God's love towards you was not just butterflies in his stomach. Thank God that God's love towards you was actually doing something. Was actually interceding for you with the death of his, his only begotten son for us. So look, love is sacrificing your needs and wants even your life for someone. So God says, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. Follow the Bible. We met a guy yesterday who said, well, to get to heaven, you just have to do those ten rules. Well, there's a lot more than ten. You know, I wanted to tell him. He's like, there's hundreds. He's like, you're in trouble, buddy. Not that you could keep ten. But look, it's talking about keeping the commandments of God. Turn to John 15. So if you don't do works, if you don't, if you're saved, you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved forever, you're sealed, and you don't do works, you don't love God. It's that simple. You say, that sounds bad. Look at John 15 and verse number 13. You know, we're, we're just, we're too obsessed with feelings and not action in, in this society that we live in. It's all about feelings. Well, I feel that I love God. And when I pray, I, I cry. You know, and oh, you know, it's all about feelings. I mean, how many of these, these Christians from these, these fake churches do you hear? I mean, they're just all like super over emotional about everything. They're not even saved. They don't have any idea what the Bible says. And they're doing nothing. There's no action at all. I mean, that's not love. Love isn't some emotion we'll experience where you just start bawling and, and getting all weird and effeminate. It's, it's not, that's not it. Love is action. Amen. And God says, if you love me, follow what I told you in the Bible. I mean, is that complicated? It's not complicated. I mean, it, it takes some effort. But doesn't action take effort? It takes some effort to love the Lord. All right, look at John 15 and verse number 13. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Here's somebody else. Here's the next list of people you're supposed to love. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. You're supposed to love them. Turn to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says that you, know, you can't have greater love than somebody than if you would sacrifice your, love or your life for them. I mean, sounds familiar, right? I mean, God's leading by example. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So look, if you are willing to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that means that you love them. Amen. If you are willing to take action to sacrifice for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that means that that's how you show your love to them. Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. So, I mean, 
helping out your brothers and sisters is part of showing your love to them, actually doing something. You know, look at the James chapter 2. The guy's like, hey, uh, you're cold. I, I, I pray that you get warm, brother. And he does nothing for him. That's not love. Love is actually doing something, is sacrificing something. Look at Matthew 22 and verse number 36. Let's see who else we should love. You're like, that's not it? No, there's more. So we should love God. We should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Who else do we need to love? Matthew 22, look at verse 36. The Bible says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. We already got that one. And with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So basically, love God and love your neighbor. You can, you can fit all the commandments under those two categories, is what Jesus is saying here. right? So look, he's saying that you need to love your neighbor too. Now, is your neighbor saved? Maybe. But your brothers and sisters is a subset of your neighbor. A neighbor your neighbor is everybody around us. Is our neighbor. Anybody who is not your personal enemy or an enemy of God is basically your neighbor. Okay, I mean, the vast majority of people out here, we should be loving as our neighbor, the Bible says. And that is through action, through sacrifice. Look, when you go out soul winning, and you're knocking on people's doors with a Bible in your hand, you are loving your neighbor. You are taking action towards those people. You're taking action to intercede for them, to be an ambassador for Christ. That's loving your neighbor. That's probably the best thing you could do to love your neighbor. You know, that's why, you know, missionaries that go out on, on mission trips or whatever and they give out diapers and Tylenol. I'm like, I mean, God forbid a, a saved Bible-believing Christian would do something like that. Leave somebody unsaved with some, some new, with, a, with a, a shed you built for them or something. Here's a nice shed. Have fun in hell. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. The best thing that you could do to love your neighbor is to preach the gospel to them. Right. Who else? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. There's more. So we've got, we've got to love God. We've got to love our brothers and sisters. We've got to love our neighbors. So the list is getting big here. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 44. The Bible also says that you are to love your enemies. You're like, man, them too? Why do you have so many enemies? I'm just kidding. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You say I'm confused. Well, let me clear it up for you. Does that say that hate God? Does that say that persecute God? Does that say that use God? No, it says you. It says people that use you and persecute you. This is your personal enemy. Look, we, we don't want to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. We, we don't want to have personal enemies, but it may happen where you have personal enemies. You know, hopefully your personal enemy is never your brother and sister in Christ. I mean, how many, I mean, we've, that's why we preach so many sermons about how to deal with conflict biblically. So you never have a personal enemy that's your brother and sister in Christ. And you know what? You shouldn't really have enemies outside of that. You'll meet people that just have a lot of enemies, though. That just make a lot of people mad. You know, the, the friend of the month people, they can't keep a friend. They, they, they always, these people did this to me. These people did this to me. These people did this to me. You meet saved people like that. They just have, they just have, they're just bad at relationships. They have a lot of personal enemies. If the Bible says that if somebody wrongs you, you are to still love them. You are to still take, you know, you're not to, you know, reward evil with evil. You're supposed to just reward evil with good. Okay, and hey, look, that's, that's, that's tough to do at times. If somebody wrongs you, it's tough to suffer yourself to be defrauded. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. All right, but the Bible says that you're to love your enemies too. All right, but, but what about God's enemies? Because we're talking about a different subset of people, right? I mean, if you think that your enemies are all God's enemies, you have a serious problem. Okay, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19. This is after Jehoshaphat became friends and was helping out uh, King Ahab. So Jehoshaphat, a good, godly king, 
was helping this wicked king. And this prophet comes and he rebukes him. Why does he rebuke him? Why does he rebuke him? Because he's an enemy of the Lord is why he rebuked him. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse number 2. And Jehu, the son of Haniah the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Turn to Psalm chapter 1, uh, Psalm 139. So here, Jehoshaphat, this good king, went out and he helped an enemy of the Lord. So we see that Ahab wasn't an enemy of Jehoshaphat, he was an enemy of the Lord. And the Bible says that you know, he hated the Lord. It says, should you help the ungodly? Should you love them that hate the Lord? And he said, God's wrath is now upon you because what you have done. I mean, I'm sorry to read the Bible to you, but your personal enemies and God's enemies are different categories. Okay, look at Psalm 139 and verse number, I'll start in 20, 21. The Bible says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am, am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? You see, you see they're actively rising up against the Lord. You see that they're taking offense against the Lord. These are not people that are just, you know, deflecting the gospel, that just don't want to hear it. They're actively against the Lord. And every single one of these pas passages, they're revolting against Him. Look at verse 22. It says, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. So look, we are supposed to take the enemies of the Lord and we're supposed to hate them. The Bible says there's a perfect hatred. You said, I don't think that we should hate anybody. Well, you're not reading the Bible. Look, if you don't hate anything, you don't love anything. Well, I mean, do you love uh, serial killers? Do you love child molesters? Because if you do, please leave this church. Amen. I mean, get out. If you, you, I love child molesters. Go. Amen. I mean, look, if you, don't, if you don't hate things that would actively destroy things that you love, it's not even logical, folks, that you would just love everything. People like that are liars anyway. People that say, I love everything, they, they hate the Bible. I mean, it's, it's true. So look, but let me point this out now. Let me close it, cap it with this. Don't go making, look, we are to make God's enemies our enemies. Follow me now, okay? But it doesn't work the other way. Don't go making your enemies God's enemies. Because there's trouble that lies ahead for you there. Because you could end up hating a brother and sister. I mean, just because you are at odds and you can't stand the person, you know, I mean, you could end up hating somebody who's a brother and sister in Christ in the Bible. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The Bible has some strong words for that. So don't, God's enemies, we should not, just like Jehu said to Jehoshaphat, you should not love them that hate the Lord. You should make them your enemies. But don't go elevating yourself to the same position as God and saying, anybody who's ever done me wrong is a hater of the Lord. Because you're, you're headed for trouble there. You're headed for trouble there. All right, let's keep going through this list here. Verse number 22. Right after love is these two words called joy and peace. Joy and peace. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Fruits of the Spirit. Love, and then we see joy and peace. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. And the Bible says... And I'm going to put these two together. I'm going to show you why I put them together. But the Bible says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That flesh is pulling at you. That tr the trial of your faith, being much more pre precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom ye now see, ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, 
turn to Romans chapter 15. I'm sorry to throw so much Bible at you here, but we've got we to gotta be in the Bible this morning. Look at Romans chapter 15. Look, joy, here, here's a definition of joy for you. Joy is like spiritual happiness. That's what it means in the Bible. All right? it's, it's happiness related to your salvation. All right? Look, um, and, and it's tied together. If you look at Romans 15 and verse 13, it's tied together with peace for good reason. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? In doing good works? And in serving God? No. It says fill you with all joy and peace in believing. It's, it's, saying, it's saying you should have joy and peace in your salvation is what it's saying, okay? In believing that you may be abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Look, think about, like, let's look at this difference between joy and happiness. Like, if I'd go out and get a new car, I've never had a brand new car. But if I would get a new car, it would make me happy, right? It, it would make me happy. But guess what? In 10 years, that car would be a piece of garbage, right? And it would be, you know, worthless and nothing. But look, that joy of your salvation is, it, you know, the Bible calls it the peace with, in Philippians chapter 4, it calls it the peace with passeth all understanding. It's much better than some new car. That's, that's, that's the joy that, you know, it, the sal your salvation that you have right now is the only eternal thing that you will ever get on this earth. Right. Think about that. Amen. You know, your car is just, you know, it's nothing, right? But that's it. I mean, in heaven, there's going to be all kinds of eternal things. But right now on earth, your salvation is the only eternal thing you're ever going to get on this earth. And that's why, that's why peace is directly related to joy. And it's called the peace with passeth all understanding. So, I mean, you say, why does that give me peace? Well, I mean, look at this country today. Everyone's afraid to die. You ever seen anything like it? Everyone is just terrified of dying today. That's, I mean, they will do the stupidest things you could possibly imagine just to make sure that there's not a 0.01% chance that they'll die. Right. <laughs> I mean, they'll walk around in hazmat suits and be afraid of everybody else. and be like, whoa, whoa, you know? I mean, just so they, they, they might not ever have a chance. And then they'll walk outside and get hit by a car. Yeah. You know, because, like, you don't know when your life's going to end. Right. That's another thing. You ask people out soul winning, hey, how long are you going to live? People know. They don't know. Yet there's some small thing that may possibly something, something. That everyone's terrified. They don't have that peace. Yeah. Now look, I mean, turn to Proverbs 28. This is people today, Proverbs 28. Look, I, I don't want to die, but I'm not afraid to die. Because ultimately, I have that peace that, you know, I know that I'm going to somewhere better. I'm going to wake up after I die, and I'm going to be like, man, what a dump I was living in down there. Because look, we know we're going to something better. We have that hope. We know it. We know. Amen. Look, that ye may know. We know. Right. This is everybody else though. Proverbs 28, look at verse number 1. The wicked flee when no one pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Everyone's just running away right now. They're scared. They're running everywhere and there's nobody even chasing them. They're running down the street. You're like, what's going on? They're like, ah! No one's chasing you. But that's why the righteous, the saved, are to be bold as a lion. If you're afraid of, if you're saved today and you're afraid of anything other than God, that's a sin. Right. Straight up, right there. So, I mean, look, they're all unsaved. That's why we're trying to get people saved so they can be bold too, so they don't have to be afraid of their own shadow. The, the Bible says there is no shadow. They're running anyway. There's no one chasing them. They don't have that peace, you see? They don't have that peace. And you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there who are not saved that are afraid of going to hell. I mean, these are the, the Catholics and the, the, the people that know of Jesus and know of you know, something of the truth and they know that there's a hell and they don't know if they're going there. Because they're like, have I done enough good works to not go there? Well, the answer is if you think that you have to do good works to get yourself out of hell, you're going to go to hell. I mean, that's the irony of that situation. Right? So we need to, you know, people need that peace that, to know that, hey, it has nothing to do with what you do. It's about, it's about trusting. It's about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. All or nothing, folks. Amen. All or nothing. So look, I don't want to die either, but I have the peace. You know what I'm saying? We have the peace. Look at the, uh, verse number 22 again. 
Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. I'm going to lump those all together because this has to do with our attitude towards other people. Fruits of the Spirit, right? So all of these in this list is talking about our attitude towards others. Right? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 12. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter twelve or verse uh, chapter three, verse number twelve. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. It's saying by the elect of God, it's saying the the saved people, the people that are saved. Okay, if you are saved, you are uh, the elect. Amen. Okay, the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. That means you know you're just filled with mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind meekness, long-suffering. So we see those two words there as well. We see another word introduced here that sort of sums up you know, these, these last words that we saw in Galatians chapter 5, 22. It says, bowels of mercies. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In, in Matthew chapter 5, we see the Beatitudes. And, and it's really interesting that the Beatitudes, it pretty much lines up with the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. But look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And the be other Beatitudes of Matthew 5, blessed are the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. When, when you go out soul winning, you're a peacemaker. You are, bringing, you are bringing that peace. You know, somebody who's afraid and they don't know what comes after. I mean, if an atheist tells you they know what's going to happen when they die, they're, they're not being honest with you. They don't know. They don't know. Most atheists are just agnostic, not to go off on this. But I mean, just think about all the knowledge in the world, right? I mean, think about you're so smart, right? Think of if this pie is all the knowledge that's ever existed and how much percent of that pie do you think the smartest person knows? Maybe one percent? Probably not, right? But you don't think that there's any chance in that 99 percent of things that you don't know that there could be a God and that that God could have something for you and all this. Look, they're agnostic. They don't know. There's no atheist. There's no honest atheist anyway. Okay? I don't know. That, nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But look, you're a peacemaker. You're bringing peace to people. You're bringing them that peace that you have because you know that there's something better for you. You're going to heaven. Okay, so the list of the Beatitudes is very, very similar. I mean, I want to be blessed. So the Bible basically says that blessed are you if you're in the fruits of the Spirit, basically is what it's saying. Amen. Okay, look at Luke chapter 6, verse 36. But this word mercy keeps coming up when it's, when it's describing these fruits of the Spirit. This word mercy keeps coming up over and over and over again. Look at Luke 6 and verse 36. I really want to focus on mercy. And look at verse 36 of Luke chapter 6. The Bible says, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Okay, and then in Matthew 5, remember, it said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So there's this definite theory, this, this uh, philosophy that the Bible is telling us again and again and again, that if you're merciful, your Heavenly Father will have mercy on you. Amen. Okay, so we're not only commanded to be merciful, long-suffering, gentle, but a measure of this towards others is what God will perform towards us. Isn't that nice? I mean, that's pretty simple. The more merciful you are, the more long-suffering you are, the more gentle you are to other people. The Bible says that that's how God will deal with you. That's pretty good, right? Unless, you know, you're, you're no good at it. Because that's how God's going to deal with you. It's true in both cases. Okay, so we see this these wonderful list of things that we should do. You say, okay, I saw the works of the flesh. I saw the, the fruits of the Spirit. How does that apply to me? What are you even talking about? All right, but look, what, you say, which one am I? I mean, we preach the works of the flesh. We preach, you know, the fruits of the Spirit. This morning I went through and just gave you a quick overview of what those things are and what the Bible says about those things. Which one are you? Well, unless you are in your glorified body right now, which you're not, you are both. Right. You're both. And look, most people are going to be a mix of the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. Everybody is a mix 
of the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. That's why Galatians chapter 5 is such a great tool for us. Because it shows us you know, where we're at. Maybe you should go through the list every now and then and kind of hold that mirror up to yourself and see how you're doing. So like before, you know, and you need to understand this about others as well, is that, you know, here's the thing. There's 26 different things listed in Galatians chapter 5. As far as the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, there's 26 different things. That means there's 26 different combinations and each single one of them could have, you could be at a, at a different level uh, on each single one of those things. I mean, it is, it is infinite. The, the combinations that you will have, no one's going to be the same. It's, it's like a snowflake. You ever, kids, th this is amazing by the way, you ever look at pictures of snowflakes on the internet? You should do it. Have your parents show you pictures of snowflakes, like up close snowflakes on the internet. You don't believe in God? Go look at that. I mean, just perfect. I mean, that's just an artist having a good time. That's just an engineer building stuff having a good time right there. None of them look the same. They all have different patterns. And it's just, it's crazy. It's beautiful. But look, people are like that, right? We're a mix of these fruits of the Spirit and works of the flesh. You know, people are not one-dimensional. You can't take people and be like, oh yeah, he's a good guy, or he's not. He's not a good guy. Like, no. He's, first of all, none of us are good guys. And second of all, we all have our different problems. We all grew up different. We grew up in different cultures. We grew up in different families. We, you know, you may struggle with something that I don't struggle with. I may struggle with something that you don't struggle with. I mean, so have some patience and mercy with people Amen. is the point. Because none of us are, are the same combination. None of us, look, that's why you come to church and listen to the Bible preached at you. That's why you should be reading the Bible. So you can fill in your gaps. Your gaps. You say, you know, but I love the Lord, and I live this separated life, and I've defeated a lot of the sin in my life, and, you know, everybody else just stinks. Because I'm awesome! I mean, you'll find people like this. But look, you have no patience, you have no long-suffering, you're unmerciful, you're harsh, which is the opposite of gentle. I mean, you've got a lot of work to do in those cases. And I mean, look, as you clean, look, as you clean up your life, and, as, and you're going to see this, and we're already seeing it in this church, your life will change if you come here. That's right. Your life will change if you listen to the Bible, and you do these things, and you, you take the preaching, and you'll be like, you know what, that was... That was uncomfortable to hear, but the Bible says that. And I don't, th this is difficult to not put my kids where I was putting them before and do things at home. It's more work for me. But if you start to follow what the Bible says, your life will change. No doubt. Your life will change. But look, then you have to fight this thing when you see people that are in a different part of the path than you. And that's where, you know, the mercy and the gentleness comes in. Right? So, I mean, th that's, a, that's a risk for people that are just getting things together really fast. Yeah. You know, that's a risk. It can cause all kinds of strife between, between brethren. You know, oh, so-and-so did this, and he keeps doing this. Well, look, maybe he didn't, you know, maybe his parents didn't teach him that. Maybe he just needs to catch up in that area. I mean, have some mercy. I mean, look, here's what I do. I think of it from a risk management perspective. You say you're overthinking this. I don't think so. Just li li let me explain. Risk management, what is that? It's looking, it's looking at all possible outcomes and then trying to take precautionary steps to minimize the damage to those outcomes. All right, so look, if you're like super hyper judgmental of somebody where you could have shown mercy, I mean, because honestly, most times that people are like hyper judgmental, it's not even in their wheelhouse. It's, they have no authority in the situation. They're, it's not anything that they could ever change. They shouldn't even be involved in it in the first place. Most of the time. So look, there are situations when you need to judge righteous judgment, like your kids, like that's your wheelhouse, right? Like my kids are my wheelhouse. Your kids, not so much. 
Bro, a pastor in a church, that's his wheelhouse. Amen. Like, so he, you know, he can judge righteous judgment in those situations. But look, don't go around flaming every single situation because if you get it wrong, you put yourself in danger of judgment. James 2.13 says, For he shall have judgment without mercy. Do you want judgment without mercy? That hath showed no mercy. Do I have to say it again? He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Operate your life that way. Operate your life where you just show no mercy to anybody. Well, let me know how it goes for you. It, I mean, as for me, as difficult as it is at times, I'm just going to err on the side of mercy. Because you know what? I know this for sure. I'm going to need it someday. Amen. I'm going to need mercy. And it, I don't, I don't want to die by the sword. It's, <laughs> it's really that simple. And that's, that's what the Bible teaches. When Jesus told Peter to put his sword away, that he's teaching the same philosophy. That's right. If you live your life like that towards people, that's how God's going to treat you. And it's going to be ugly. Right? I don't want to die by the sword. Period. So look, think about us, okay? Let's just wrap this thing up. Think about us. Think about this church. We're all saved here, hopefully, right? But the fact is that we're on this super complicated journey together, right? We're on this journey together. It's this spiritual journey through life. The end goal, look, the end goal is the same, right? The glorified state, heaven, but we didn't all start in the same place. Some people started late. Some people started earlier. Some people, and the path is different for every single person. I mean, it, it's, it's a different path. We're all in different spots on that path. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. You know, whether it's the ministry for you, whether it's serving in a church for you, whether it's just being a, a solid soul winner for you, I mean, everybody's path is different. Some people are the eyes, some people are the legs, some people are the hand. I mean, we can't all be an ear. I mean, everybody has different different callings and different places that they're to serve. Look at 1 John chapter 5. This is really what it all comes down to. The goal is the same for all of us. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God and over overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. Now, I skipped this word in the fruits of the Spirit because I was saving it to the end. I skipped the word faith. Look, to overcome the world, to walk, in the Spirit. Remember we started out, we should walk in the Spirit. It is a measure of your faith. How much you walk in the Spirit or you're in the works of the flesh is a measure of your faith. And your faith is made perfect through your walk. Turn to James 2.22. So you really, I mean, you really could say that the true measuring stick of where you are at whether it be the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit, is, is a demonstration of where your faith is. Right? I mean, if you're just, I mean, think of it just from the, the example of peace. If you're afraid of everything, look, if you're saved and you're afraid of everything, you have weak faith. It's a measuring stick. You're saying, you're saying, I'm saved, but I don't have any peace. Does that mean I'm not saved? No. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, you're saved. But I have no peace Be, because your faith is weak. It, it's, it's that simple. Look at James 2.22. Seest thou faith, how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Works will make your faith perfect. Or the works of the flesh will weaken your faith. It, it, it's, it works both ways. So the fruits of the Spirit will perfect your faith. The works of the flesh will weaken it. Where are you at today? Think about it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.